Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. We are back today. I had to take a break from doing YouTube videos for a month or two because I've been super busy with content creation, other interviews, and other product related tasks, but we are back today with something new. As you can see, we are going to be discussing existing debt and leverage buyouts and specifically why a company's capital structure does not make that much of a difference in LBO scenarios. Here's the typical question we get. How important is a company's existing capital structure? In other words, its debt and equity before it is acquired in a leverage buyout. Some guides and resources say that ideal LBO candidates should have minimal debt, but why does that matter at all? The short answer to this question is that these guides and resources and books are incorrect. The existing capital structure in a leverage buyout does not matter much at all. Now, I'm hedging myself a little bit by saying much here. As we'll see, there are a few cases where it makes a bit of a difference, but for the most part, it doesn't matter because in an LBO, the private equity firm replaces the company's entire capital structure with new debt and equity. Now, some people understand this argument, but they come back and say, that's true, but if a company doesn't have much debt yet, the private equity firm can use more debt to fund the deal. This line of thinking is tempting, but it's actually logically flawed. Because if you think about how the valuation and debt financing process works for a minute, you'll see that, once again, the amount of debt a company currently has makes no difference to the amount that a PE firm can use to fund the deal. And we'll go through some examples in Excel and you'll see exactly how this works. The purchase price in an LBO is almost always based on an enterprise value to EBITDA multiple. Even if it's a public company and you have to pay a premium to its share price, ultimately the PE firm is still concerned with the enterprise value to EBITDA purchase multiple. To make things simple for now, we're gonna look at the scenario where the purchase enterprise value of a company is 1,000, the implied EBITDA purchase multiple is 10x because the company has 100 in EBITDA initially. This company has 520 of existing equity, 500 of existing debt, and cash of 20. And so all that together adds up to a purchase enterprise value of 1,000. The existing debt to EBITDA is therefore 5x because they have 500 of debt and 100 of EBITDA. So let's go through and see how this works. In a scenario like this, the PE firm is going to use an amount of debt based on reasonable leverage and coverage ratios. So if the median for deals in this market is five times debt to EBITDA, the private equity firm is probably gonna to push to use that. Now, the important point is this, regardless of whether the company has zero debt or four times debt to EBITDA initially, it's still gonna have five times debt to EBITDA afterward. And here's how it works in Excel. We can see here that we've set it up a little bit differently. We're using a percentage assumption. In this case, the company before the deal has 5x debt to EBITDA, and after the deal, it also has 5x debt to EBITDA. Now, if we changed around these numbers, let's think about what would happen. Let's say that we bumped down the company's existing equity to 420, and then we increased its existing debt to 600, so the enterprise value is the same. Well, even with 600 of existing debt, we still get 500 of debt and 500 of equity used to fund this deal. And perhaps more importantly, the IRR of 24.3% here stays the same. If we change this around even more, let's say, for example, that we made the company have 1,020 of existing equity and zero of existing debt. After the fact, the new company, the one acquired in this LBO, still has 500 of debt and 500 of equity. And more importantly, the IRR and the multiple both stay the same. Now, of course, we've assumed here that regardless of the company's capital structure, its enterprise value in the deal stays the same, which is the standard assumption, because as we mentioned before, these deals are usually based on enterprise value to EBITDA multiples. So that's the basic reason why the existing capital structure doesn't make much of a difference, if at all. And as I say right here, if the deal is being funded with 5x debt and 5x equity, the PE firm is still gonna to have to contribute 5x equity regardless of what the capital structure looked like before. So if you think about this concept, since the multiple is based on enterprise value, existing debt would affect things only if it somehow increased the company's enterprise value. So if we went into this analysis and we said, 
Well, as a direct result of having debt, let's say the company has 700 of debt and therefore its purchase enterprise value goes up to 1,200. But as you know, that's not really what happens because if a company raises 200 of additional debt, the company also gets 200 of additional cash. And so if we get negative 220 for the cashier, the purchase enterprise value stays the same at 1,000. And you've seen that before with some of our other examples and tutorials where if a company raises a thousand of debt, for example, the cash goes up by a thousand, the debt goes up by a thousand, they cancel each other out and the company's enterprise value stays the same. So that's the ultimate reason why this doesn't make a difference because even if a company's capital structure changes as we just showed you, its purchase enterprise value should stay the same. So unless you incorrectly believe that debt increases a company's enterprise value, the capital structure in a leverage buyout doesn't matter. Now you might be wondering if there are exceptions. I mentioned earlier that there are a few cases where it may make a bit more of a difference. Let's look at two of those exceptions right now and go down the proverbial rabbit hole. The first rabbit hole I wanna to draw to your attention is the concept of call premiums. Often with debt, there are restrictions on early repayment. For example, with a lot of 10 year or 15 year or 20 year unsecured bonds, companies are restricted from repaying it early. And if they do wanna repay it early, often they will have to pay some type of premium to do so. A typical schedule might look like this. In the first two years, the company can't repay any of the debt early at all. In years three and four, it can repay all the debt early, but it has to repay out 105% of the outstanding amount. In years five through six, it has to repay 103% of the total amount if it wants to do it. And then it goes to 101%. And then it goes to 100% in years nine through 10. So at that point, if the company wants to repay the debt a little bit early, it's perfectly fine to do so. And they're just going to pay the normal amount. As a result, these call premiums make it more expensive to repay the debt early. And so if a private equity firm goes in and a company has just raised the debt three years ago or four years ago or five or six years ago, it will be more expensive to repay the debt. And that is going to increase the company's effective purchase enterprise value in a leverage buyout. You can see an example of a typical call premium structure here where in the first two years, the first four half year periods here, there is no early redemption allowed. And then after that, we get 105, 104, 103, 102, and so on going all the way across. Now, the question you have to ask yourself with this is how much these actually matter. So let's go back to our same example. Say the company has five times debt to EBITDA already. The purchase enterprise value to EBITDA multiple is 10x. If all the debt has a 110% call premium, then the purchase enterprise value to EBITDA multiple increases to 10.5x. Let's look at the math for that in Excel. Right now, we've assumed the call premium on existing debt is 100%. And you can see it right here. We're just taking the 500. We're multiplying by this percentage minus one. Let's say that we make it 110% instead. So now we have this call premium. We have increased the effective purchase enterprise value because the private equity firm has to contribute more debt or more equity or a combination of both to fund this deal. In this case, it's a combination of both. They have to use more debt and more equity both go up from 500 to 525. The implied purchase multiple also goes up to 10.5x. The IRR and money on money multiple drop a little bit. The multiple goes down to 2.8x. The IRR goes down to about 22.5%. Of course, in the grand scheme of things, this is an IRR decrease of 2%, which probably no one cares about. The other thing I would point out is that the call premium is usually much less than 110%. It might be 105 or 103, and it's usually not gonna be on the entire debt balance. It might be on some smaller portions, such as the company's unsecured bonds. So the bottom line is that this factor makes a bit of a difference, but it doesn't really matter that much, and it only comes up in very select and unusual scenarios. Now, there is another exception that I wanna draw your attention to, so let's go down rabbit hole number two. This is the concept of lender familiarity. People like what's familiar to them and investors are the same. 
if they already know a company or an industry, they will be much more likely to invest in it for the most part. If a company already has debt, therefore, that could help its case in a leverage buyout because lenders might be more familiar with the company and its ability to service that debt. A real life analogy is that if you want to borrow money for a home, you need to show some evidence of your loan repayment history. You need to show that you've paid off your credit cards. You've been responsible with them. You haven't done anything crazy. And if you can do that, you will be able to get the money for a home mortgage more easily. It's the same idea with companies. If a company has borrowed responsibly and paid interest and repaid its debt in the past, it is more reliable than one that has not. And so lenders might be more likely to go along with the deal and invest in the company's debt issuances if you can show some evidence of that. Of course, this point doesn't affect the purchase price or the IRR. It just makes it easier to get the deal done in the first place. You might be able to argue that the company could get a lower coupon rate or better terms if the lenders know it, but that's a bit of a stretch. So for example, you could go back to the LBO model and say that maybe since lenders already know this company, it's already had debt in the past, it could get a 9% interest rate rather than a 10% interest rate, which would boost the IRR a little bit. But even something like that is quite a stretch. In all likelihood, it's not going to seriously impact the terms or even impact them at all. It's just going to make it easier to get the deal done. The bottom line is that the company's existing capital structure and debt barely make a difference. And so you should not be citing this as an answer in interviews when explaining what constitutes an ideal LBO candidate. Let's do a recap and summary now. A company's existing capital structure doesn't matter in leverage buyout scenarios because the PE firm replaces the company's existing equity and debt with all new equity and debt, usually in different amounts and percentages. A company's ability to service debt matters a lot, but that's separate from how much debt it has right now. You could have a company with no debt that could easily take on debt and service it very effectively, and you could also have one that has a lot of existing debt but can barely service it because its cash flows are unstable, because it can't meet its interest payments. So these are different concepts, and they don't actually have that much to do with each other. There are some exceptions. If there are call premiums and the company has recently raised debt and they're going to have to pay some type of huge premium to repay it early, that could make a difference. Lender familiarity also matters, and if a company has a track record of servicing its debt well, that could improve its chances of getting the deal done. On the flip side, if it has a spotty track record or a history where they've defaulted, for example, that could make it much harder to get a deal done. But in the grand scheme of things, if you had to make a list of 500 criteria for ideal leverage buyout candidates, the existing capital structure would be item number 499 on the list. The purchase price, the cash flow stability, credit stats and ratios, the industry, the market, the competitors, management team, all those matter far more than the company's existing capital structure. 